And this message entitled, Taking Your Life in Your Own Hands, was delivered to Christ of Rock Bible Church on July 23rd, 2017 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren, Jr. Glory to God. Taking your life in your own hands. That's the title of my message. It kind of morphed a little bit through the week. Kind of made a little changes here and there with it. But that's basically what it comes down to. Taking your life into your own hands. Okay? So let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Father, we want to thank you, dear God, for this gathering today. I want to thank you, Lord, for those visiting with us and they are certainly more than welcome, dear God, to continue to come. Praise the name of Jesus. I want to thank you, Lord, for gathering our hearts and our spirits, dear God. I do pray once again, Lord, that you would touch Cindy if she's not been well. And I pray, dear God, that you would uh, be upon others, like Joel, who's traveling, and, and uh, all of these other things. And, and we pray earlier, Lord, for Cheryl and her uh, health considerations and so forth. And, we just, we just bring that all before you, dear God, and we give you the glory. Because we know, Lord, that your hand is on all things. And sometimes when Satan really hits us with things, dear God, we want to just uh, uh, set that aside and, 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 and we don't want to think, dear God, that this could possibly have anything to do with you. But your word says, your word says that everything is in your hand. Everything is in your hands. And I, I Lord, I've said this before, I, I hesitate uh, talking about that or praying about that sometimes because then comes the test. Sometimes the test comes in all kinds of ways. Some maybe are easier than others. Some are tragic even. And I just pray, dear God, that you would just touch our hearts to always cling to this, dear God, that you are in control. You are in control. And it doesn't matter what the world looks like. It doesn't matter what a mess se things seem to be. You didn't make it into a mess. You gave people free will and people have chosen to make it into a mess. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that we would choose you instead of a mess. We would choose your Holy Spirit, dear God, instead of a discordant life. I thank you, dear God, for the opportunity here to gather for worship and to view all of these things, Lord, as a beautiful chord on an organ that comes together and speaks out your glory and grace. And we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We need you today, dear God. We need you in a very deep and real way. Everybody here does. And I pray, dear God, we just come, submit, surrender, and let you have the reins. Let you be in total control, dear God. So Lord, we turn to your supernatural, cosmic, first aid kit. And you, dear God, you don't just put a band-aid on something. You actually change. That's what's so different about your first aid kit. And other ones we see. So I want to thank you and praise you and give you the glory today. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You know, I thought of this um, uh, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, but I'm just now starting to think of it again. Remember that, um, that uh, amplifier thing you gave me, that small one, you know, that I use for the Bible studies and so forth? Works great. Um, we used, it at, we used it out at Crooked Creek, and I thought it worked great. I think, with, especially in the summertime, with the fans running and so forth, it would be, that would probably work here too. Probably be good. So I'll set that up for next week, okay? In the meanwhile, I'll scream at you. Okay? 
Now you can probably hear me all right, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep that in mind and, and uh, speak up. Taking your life into your own hands. Taking your life into your own hands. Anybody here ever hear of the InVenture place? Did you ever hear of the InVenture place? I'll admit, I hadn't either until I saw this story. The InVenture place is a museum that is dedicated to the creative process. It was opened to the public on this day, July 23rd. All right? Back in 1995, 22 years ago today, in Akron, Ohio. And ever since it opened, people have been flocking from all over the world to Akron, Ohio, just to see this museum. Now, I'm, su I'm sure lots of people have traveled some distances, because you know what it's about? It's about inventions. It's called the Inventure Place. It's about inventions. The museum offers hands-on exhibits, special events, interactive programs to help people discover, and I quote, discover the inventor in you. To discover the inventor in you. The National Inventors Hall of Fame was organized in 1973 by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And now is... Uh, now it is called and is known as, now listen to this, the National Council of Intellectual Property Law Associations. Just between you and me and the fence post, leave it to government to make it really complicated. <laughs> right? The National Coun Council of Intellectual Property Law Associations. Each year, the selection committee of the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and probably George Foreman's right in there, you know, with his grill. You know, he's always pushing for people to call, what's the place called? Invent Help or something. You got an idea, you want to market it, you go ahead and you try to work through this stuff, and you notice on the screen it says, not everybody has success with this. <laughs> It depends on what your invention is, you know. There can be some uh, good inventions and some not so good ones. Well, this Hall of Fame chooses inventors for induction from a list of people nominated by their peers and by the public. Representatives from national, technical, and scientific organizations make up the committee. As of 2004... The year 2004, 221 inventors have been inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame. Now there's no doubt we owe a great deal of thanks to many, many dedicated, creative people whose inventions provide practical solutions to problems. They sometimes improve the quality of daily living. I mean, there's all... Every, well, everything you... Listen, people. Everything you see around you, everything you got at home, somebody invented. Right? Every tool, every ergonomic whatever, you know, makes it easier on the joints and all. Somebody invented that. Some were by accident, and some were on purpose. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to carry the inventive spirit too far. When we start taking it into the spiritual realm, we can somehow, you know, make up our own morality, we can make up our own God, make up our own uh, way to worship, our own, our own, our own. Okay? We invent it, and we can take it in a wrong direction as well. And the results are always disastrous. Our culture today has tried to replace God with man's invention of what's called moral relativism. In other words, there are no rights and wrongs. There, are, there aren't any blacks and whites. Everything's great. It's just, you know... That's the way it is. And, and it doesn't matter what you do. You can go, you know, situational ethics and all of that kind of stuff comes in because people don't want somebody bossing them around. 
a lot of times people don't want God telling them what to do. Okay? So, they enter into this, they, this invented place. It's invented. Somebody made it up. Okay? It's not God's invention. Schools today are teaching children that there are no absolute standards of right or wrong. Just what goes, how you feel, go for it. All these phrases have become so common. Choices depending on the situation. Yet there are absolute standards and God has laid them out in His Word. In His first aid kit. Praise God. Now remember, God's first aid kit is supernatural. This book is the Word of God. And that makes it supernatural. It's infallible. There's no error in it. There's nothing wrong with it. Alright? People choose to believe there is. Why? Because they don't want to be submitted to it. Oftentimes, people just go ahead and say, well, you know, man wrote it. Well, you know, man took the, the quill in hand and put down the marks on the paper, but the Bible says that God inspired every word in this book. And our God doesn't make mistakes. Our God is not wrong. Amen? So yeah, people actually wrote it down, but the Bible says they wrote it down according to what God gave them to write down. Praise God. Come on. 66 books. Some 45 authors all together throughout Old and New Testament and it all says the same thing. It all points to Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There are absolute standards. God has laid them out. God knows what they are. And it would behoove us, it would certainly lead us in the right direction if we just plain believed Him. Amen? I mean, instead of trying to, well, I need to search this out. I need to find out if this is true. It is true! Amen? Just come to the Lord and say, I know this is true. Well, the fact is, the Bible, many people have tried to prove the Bible wrong and have never done it. Archaeologists have gone out on great big digs all over the world trying to disprove Christianity. And they find out that the, that the physical thing that they're studying, the hole in the ground, the site for some former city or whatever, all proves that the Bible was right. Always. Not one mistake. Not one failure. Not one problem. Now I'm, I'm getting back to the, um, I'm talking about in the original languages. I'm talking about in the Greek and the Hebrew because somebody can come up with the most God-awful modern day translation and say, well, this is the Word of God. And actually the guy made it up. You know, I mean, that can happen. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Bible itself. Amen? And the King James is the closest to what the Bible really said when it was in the Greek and when it was in the Hebrew and when it was in the Latin. Praise God. There are things laid out by God in both the New Testament and Old Testament that are still uh, quite valid today. You've got the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. You've got the Commandments of Jesus, which by the way, somebody went through and added it up and it comes to over 1,500 commandments that Jesus made in His ministry. <laughs> you know, we got Ten Commandments in the Old, we got like over 1,500 in the New. God's trying to share something with us. God's trying to show us that He knows how to run the world. He knows how to run our lives. And uh, we need to submit to that. Situational ethics simply means that depending on the situation, this is what you do. You know? I mean, the story that was in the news just the other day, five teenage boys watch a man drown in a pond. And egg them on the whole way. You got yourself into this mess. You got into the pond. You get yourself out. And they watch them drown. And they can't do anything to the boys because it's not illegal to not do anything. Unless, of course, they were to find out that they pushed him in. And he can't swim. Then that would be considered at least manslaughter, if not murder. But no witnesses. 
So they they'll probably go scot free. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the situations and what would God say? Amen. I mean, situational ethics, it might seem logical in the moment. It might seem appealing even in the moment. But following anything other than God's standards of right and wrong amounts to no more than inventing new ways to sin. And that won't get us inducted into the hall of fame called heaven. Amen? Now, some inventions just happen to happen. Somebody put one chemical in with another, put too much, didn't realize they put too much, and it made something. You know? Some polymer, some thing, some... I mean, have you ever gone through the toy stores and you've seen things like slime? You know? And you play with it and it goes... You know? Somebody really plan on making that? Or is that a byproduct of something somebody was trying to do? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But there's some, there's some weird stuff. You know, when I was a kid, there was something called plastic goop. Came in a plastic bottle, and it was just goop. And you poured it into a mold, and you put down the thing, and you baked it, and it turned into a creepy crawler. Turned into a bug. Ever have one? Huh? You did? You know what I'm talking about. Okay? Who made up that stuff? You know? Do you think it might have been a byproduct of something they were try- uh, something else they were trying to make? I, I mean, I don't know. You think? Okay. All right. Uh, some people worked at it for years. You think of people like Thomas Edison and... You know, um, Alexander Graham Bell, they worked at it. Some, some people did things or came up with things in short periods of time. Some people took a long time. Thomas Edison, the light bulb, totally, totally changed the world as we know it from the way we didn't know it. You know, when you had to have, you know, kerosene lanterns and candles and all that kind of stuff, now there's light bulbs. Good, bad, or indifferent, there's, there's light bulbs. All right? What about Alexander Graham Bell? You know, the telephone. It's changed a bit. Huh? It's changed a bit. Used to be a crank thing on the wall, and you held one piece here, and you put your mouth over here. Used to have, when I was a kid, you, you had a, a phone, it was plugged in, you had a cord on it, you didn't get five feet from that phone. Now everybody runs around with, with you know, these things up against their ears and trying to drive and everything else and but that's not Alexander Graham Bell's fault. He invented the telephone. Everybody somebody else invented all this other stuff that goes along with it. But most inventors, I'll say many, if I can't say most, I'll say many, were scoffed at what they were doing. People looked down on them. That's that's a fool's mission. That's ridiculous. That's never going to come about. And it probably, all of it probably made the inventor think that he was kind of taking his own life into his own hands in pursuing this thing. Because people would scoff him and maybe even get mad and threaten him and everything else because he's wasting time and money. And I wonder if Peter, our Peter, from the book of Acts, and by the way, just to bring everybody up to date, we are looking at the various messages, the sermons that are in the book of Acts, and we're looking at what God was trying to speak through those messages of Peter and Paul and probably a few others along the way. And, and, and f- why? For the church. But why that message for the church then? You see, the church isn't supposed to be any different today. The church is supposed to be like the church of 2,000 years ago. The original church. It's supposed to be on fire for God and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's no different than it was back after Pentecost. 
And the same thing's supposed to be going on today. Amen? So I think it's a good idea to take some time and look at the messages that we find in the book of Acts and see how they apply to today. So, let's do that. I wonder if Peter ever felt that he was taking his life into his own hands with any particular message or confrontation that he would be uh, put in the middle of as he is uh, involved in ministry now that it's after Pentecost. I'm thinking he just might have felt that way when he tried a new kind of preaching. And our scripture text today is about that new kind of preaching. He is preaching to the rich and the powerful. Amen? I mean, before it's just whoever gathered. It's just, you know, several thousand people gathered on Pentecost. Several hundred people probably gathered when they were at the temple and the, and the lame man was healed. We talked about that over the last couple of weeks. Okay? Just, you know, people. Everyday people. Like us. You know, every day. There's nobody, you know, rich or famous or, you know, ruling the world or anything like that. But he had a time when he had the rich and the famous right there in the pew, so to speak. And so he gave him a message. And we're going to work together at this. We're going to see what he gave him. Okay? So I want you to tell the story and then I'll explain it. Okay? So Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So there's the first part of our text. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, the healing of the lame man outside of the temple that we talked about the last couple of weeks had taken place within a part of the temple area which was continually thronged, I mean thronged, with a lot of people. The spotlight of publicity was inevitably focused upon this particular incident. There was no getting around it. Everybody would come to know what had happened. And that was part of God's plan. Amen? It didn't happen in some backwoods community. It didn't happen over on an alley, you know, behind 4th Street or whatever. Uh -uh. No, it, it happened where there would be a lot of people and where a lot of people would come to know about it. The gate beautiful that is mentioned in this story was the gate from which the court of the Gentiles uh, came to the, uh, connected with, so to speak, the court for the women in the temple. The court of the Gentiles was at once the largest and the busiest of all the temple courts. For into it, anyone of any nation could come just as long as they did obey the ordinary laws, rules, and regulations of decency and decorum. He didn't come, you know, in there and, um, you know, act totally crazy or, you know, whatever. Might be why one, that might be one reason why they got so mad at Jesus because he came into that place where the money changers were and overturned the tables and threw everything around and so forth to show them that it wasn't supposed to be a place of merchandise. It was a house of prayer. See, that's where the money changers had their booths set up. The sellers of sacrificial animals had their stalls set up. 
And around the outer boundary of the temple area ran two great colonnades meeting at a right angle, hallways so to speak, meeting at a right angle in the corner of the court of the Gentiles. This, this one was the royal porch and the other was Solomon's porch. That's the names of them. They too were crowded with people who had come to worship, to learn, to sightsee. I mean, there were so many different reasons people could be there. Clearly, the whole series of events was going to gain the widest publicity. And that was part of God's plan. This did not happen in some out-of-the-way nook or cranny. This is happening right there in the middle of stuff. It's part of God's plan. There's no doubt about this. That people would come to know what was happening right there. Praise God. And into this crowded scene came the priests. The superintendent of the temple and the Sadducees. The bigwigs. The uppity ups. The rich. The famous. Not just your ordinary people. Now the man whom the King James calls the captain of the temple was an official called Sagan. S-A-G-A-N. Had nothing to do with Carl Sagan and you know billions and billions of this or that or whatever. Okay? That was his title. He was the high priest's right hand man. In particular, he had the oversight of the good order of the temple. He kept things moving. He kept it right. However, you know, when it came to uh, making it a place of merchandise and all of that, obviously he had failed. But that had happened over the decades and perhaps centuries as well. When the crowd had gathered, it was inevitable that he and his temple police would arrive on the scene. And with him came the Sadducees, who were the wealthy aristocratic class. There were not many of them, but they were rich. And they had great influence. The whole matter annoyed them very greatly for two reasons. First, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Everybody knew that. So when Jesus comes along and starts talking about and actually raising people from the dead and himself being raised from the dead, he stirred up a real, what, nest of honeybees? (laughs) A real bucket, you know, a Pandora's box. And it was this very truth that the apostles were proclaiming. The resurrection of the dead. Now someone once said, you see that's why they're called Sadducees. Because they're sad, you see. Did anybody anybody here make that up? Who made that up? I thought it was one of you guys. No? You heard it somewhere maybe. Karen? Karen? I don't know. Oh, is that? Oh, she's the one that mentioned it, so maybe she's the one that came up with it. Could be. They're sad, you see. Why? Because they don't believe in the resurrection. It does help you to remember who they are and what they believe and what they don't believe, doesn't it? Well, secondly, because they were wealthy aristocrats, the Sadducean party collaborated, okay, or corroborated, maybe would be a better word for it, Uh, with the rulers of the day. Who was what? The Romans. So the Sadducees were in tight with the Romans. And why? For their own necks. For their own good. You know? They tried to keep things calm. They tried to keep things, you know, between the Romans and the Sadducees. They worked at keeping a good relationship between what what they considered a good relationship between the Romans and the Jewish people. Okay? Why? Because the Romans could take away all the benefits they had given the Jews. They were allowed to worship. They were allowed to have their own temple. They were allowed to have their synagogues. They were allowed all of this stuff. And it could be taken away in a moment's notice. So, let's keep the status quo. Let's keep it nice and friendly. Let's, let's keep everybody, you know, liking each other and so forth. 
they tried to keep on friendly terms with the Romans in order that they might retain, that they might keep their wealth, their comfort, their prestige, and their power. The Roman gover government was quite tolerant on things like this. But, when it came to public disorder, they were not tolerant at all. They were absolutely merciless. This is what Pilate, in the trial of Jesus, was worried about. And they, did, they, they, turned, they actually did what they said they were going to do, because he you know, wasn't uh, getting along with the, Roman, or with the uh, Jews at that time and wanted to release Jesus, they actually turned him in. They reported him to Caesar. And a few years later, maybe it was only a year later, he was called back to Rome. And we don't know exactly what happens to him after that, but, you know, he was scared. He was scared. He was taking his life into his own hands. And he was scared stiff. The Sadducees were sure of that. They knew that if the apostles were allowed to go unchecked, there would be riots, there would be civil disorder that would all follow disastrous consequences to their status. The Romans would have a fit, the Romans would cut off the synagogues and the temple and all of the worship and the sacrifices and all of that and, and put them almost in slave labor. They were quite sure of that. Therefore, they proposed to nip this movement in the bud. And that is why Peter and John were so promptly arrested. Do you ever wonder about that? I mean, they didn't do that much. And all of a sudden, man, they're dragged off to jail. They're, they're arrested. Well, that's why. They wanted to stop any riot that might have taken place, any place of discord. It is a terrible example of a party of men who in order to retain their vested interests would not themselves listen to the truth or give anyone else a chance to hear it. It was a very stifling proposition. Everybody would be affected. I mean, I mean if, if their status changed and the Romans really buckled down, everything would have changed. It would have been a real mess for them. So they just tried to keep things nice. And by the way, that doesn't work either. Because there is true and there is false. <laughs> Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. I want to go into the next section of Scripture the last section that we're going to be looking at here today. And that's Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander and many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem and when they had set them in the midst they asked by what power or by what name have you done this then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders of Israel if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let, us, let it be known to all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you cru crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by whom him this man stands before you whole, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which is become the chief cornerstone. Now as there now is there, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Amen. Praise God. This is Peter's message. This is the sermon. 
that we're talking about. It's short and it's sweet. There it is right there. Jesus who is who He said He was. He is the Son of God. He's the one who's truly in control. He's the Messiah. You crucified Him. Alright? And, and it made it clear He was the stone that you rejected, you builders rejected, and He has become the head of the corner. In other words, people, you blew it. In other words, people, you blew it. The court before which Peter and John were brought was called the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jews. Even in Roman times, it had the right to arrest people. The one thing it could not do, however, was to kill someone, to pronounce the death sentence. There was only one reason for the death sentence that they, that they could do, that they could pronounce, um, was that uh, if a Gentile trespassed into the inner courts of the temple, that person could be put to death. That was the only death penalty that they could invoke. So that's why the Jews got the Romans involved in getting rid of Jesus, because they couldn't kill him themselves. Now this Sanhedrin had 71 members. That's a lot of people for a committee meeting, I want to tell you. The high priest was the ex officio priest. In the Sanhedrin there were priests, practically all of whom were Sadducees. Nobody believed in the power of the resurrection life. And their one desire was to preserve the status quo. That, the, that their own status quo might not be lessened. In other words, they had a good gig going, they had a good thing going, and they wanted to keep it. They didn't want the Romans coming in and messing up the whole thing. They were making money on it, they were selling animals, you know, in the, in the temple. They would pronounce animals that were good for sacrifice, blem, blem, without blemish. They would pronounce them that they were blemished, and they would make the people buy new animals from them at a greatly inflated price. They had a good gig going. And they didn't want to lose it. There were scribes who were the experts of the traditional law. There were Pharisees who were the fanatics for the law. There were the elders who were respected men in the community. This is a very unusual congregation. That's what I said. This is going to be a different time of preaching than Peter had ever known and probably would ever know. All the rich and famous, all the rulers, all the people that could even kill him are gathered. And I say that because they could then take him to the Romans and the Romans could kill him. Right? They did it for Jesus. Why couldn't they do it for the lead disciple? Namely Peter. He's taking his life into his own hands, I guess is the way we would put it. He, this congregation is not filled with your average Josephs. You got it. You got it. Okay. Average Joe. Joe Blow. You know? Only I said Josephs. Okay, well, we'll use it, a, we'll use it another time, and maybe you'll remember it, and it'll be funnier the second time around. Okay. And then again, maybe not. All right. There were also uh, those described as being the priestly families. These were the same people who were sometimes called the chief priests. This is a, a real different congregation than he would, be, would have been used to. In the great days of the high priesthood, uh, it was hereditary and it was for life. But in Roman times, the office of the high priest was subject to all kinds of intrigue, and bribery and uh, cheating and stealing and everything else, corruption, and the high priest rose and fell so that between 37 BC and 67 AD there were no fewer than 28 high priests. Now for an office that's supposed to be covered by hereditary concerns, you know, father is the high priest and the son is the high priest the grandson is the high priest and so forth that's a lot 
of people. 28 different high priests. It's got a high turnover rate. But even after a high priest had been deposed, he often remained the power behind the throne. And we see this in the trial of Jesus, when both Annas and Caiaphas are involved in the trial of Jesus. When one is the high priest, and one is his father-in-law who used to be the high priest. See what I mean? Secondly, although the high priesthood had ceased to be hereditary, it was still the prerogative of very few families. Of the 28 high priests already mentioned, six, all but six rather, came from four priestly families. So it's still very concentrated and only coming from a small group of people. The members of these families had the special prestige and it is they who were known as the chief priests. Today we would call it nepotism. And we've seen it in our own history. And I'm not saying it's, neither, it's good or bad or indifferent or anything, but nepotism is simply where you, uh, you bring in your close family into the position, into the office, and then you work together with a close family member. We saw this back with the Kennedys. When John Kennedy was president, Bobby Kennedy was attorney, attorney general. And Teddy Kennedy was a senator. And there was all kinds of accusation of nepotism back then. That he's, he's got all these people in his pockets, so to speak, because they're family members. And then now you know today in this administration, there's a son-in-law that's way at the top. There's a... You know, there's a, a son that's, you know, up there too and has official responsibilities and all that. That's also been called nepotism. I'm not saying it's illegal or anything. It's just that's what it is. It's, it's incorporating people that are close to you and, and even family, actual family members um, into these spots. When we read Peter's sermon and remember to whom it was spoken, the rich and the famous, the rulers, the, the synagogue leaders, the temple leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. We recognize one of the world's greatest demonstrations of courage. And now I'm talking about Peter. To get up in that pulpit, so to speak, and talk to all these people that could do all kinds of stuff to him in the long run. And he still tells him what he told him. Jesus is the Messiah and you killed him. He was taking his own life into his own hands. It was spoken to an audience of the wealthy, wealthiest, the most intellectual, the most powerful in the land. And yet Peter, a Galilean fisherman, never went to school, never went to college, never had a degree, never had and none of this stuff. He stands before them essentially as their judge rather than as their victim. You see, that's what it could have been. He could have become their victim. In fact, all the disciples were scared stiff when Jesus was taken and when He was crucified. They were scared stiff that they were going to be next. That they were going to be grabbed because they were followers of Jesus. That's why they hid in that upper room. That's why they locked all the doors. And that's when Jesus came. That's when Jesus came, appeared to them in the middle of the room and proved, absolutely proved who He was. Do you see? This is not by accident. Amen? God's working this out. He literally invents the situation. Amen? This was the very court which had condemned Jesus to death. These are the same people. This is not long after Jesus was sent to the cross. Peter knew that he was taking his life into his own hands. I mean, it would... I, I guess it... The only thing I could, I could possibly um, 
equate this to might be when we were back in the Presbyterian church and if I had to stand up and, and either speak or preach or teach or whatever to a whole room full of Presbyterian pastors, that might be kind of a similar thing. And yet I stood, the, stood up and told them that God's Word is God's Word. When half of them believed it's just a history book and we don't have to listen to it anymore. And they said so. We don't have to listen to this anymore. This, this book is just a history book. It's not God's Word. Pastors saying that. Can you imagine? Pastors saying that. That's why the church is in such a mess nowadays. Because we got pastors that are leading people to not believe God's Word. I told you about the so-called revival down in Florida. They actually told their people, put away your Bibles, put them back up on the shelves, get rid of them, you don't need them, God's doing a new thing. Get rid of your Bibles. Actually happened, I saw it on videotape. Further, this was the very court that had actually condemned Jesus. I think there are two kinds of courage. And I put this in the paper this past week. And I just want you to hear this again. Maybe you saw it in the paper, but I'm going to give it to you again. There is the reckless courage, which is scarce, aware of the dangers it is facing. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen people enter into this kind of courage. They just... They just move forward like a bull in a china shop, not caring which way this falls or that falls or this goes or that goes. And they're just, you know, they don't, they don't care if somebody shoots them. They don't care if somebody grabs them and puts them in jail or kills them or anything else. They're just, they're just going to do their thing. They're just going to do it. Right or wrong, they're just going to do their thing. Alright? And people look at them and they go, oh, what courage? Yeah, well, what kind of courage? There's a far higher courage, a cooler courage, which knows the peril in which it stands and refuses to be daunted. Peter gets up and tells them, Jesus was the Messiah and you killed him. You killed him. And I said last week, and I'll be real clear, we all did. The Bible says everybody has sinned. Everybody. And everybody's fallen short of the glory of God because of that sin. And Jesus came and suffered and died to take away sin. So He came to take away our sin too. We all put Him on the cross. But praise God. Praise God. Jesus willingly went to that cross. Suffered, died, rose again. Sits in heaven this very day at the right hand of the Father and prays for His church. Amen? Praise God for that. Praise God for that. We could all be sent to hell. We've all sinned. We all deserve to go. But Jesus came along and paid the price. Now you've got to receive that price. You've got to come and say, God, I, I know what you did for me. And I receive it. I, I want to have it change my heart and change my life. Come into me and work in me. I want to put my life in your hands, Jesus. Amen? Praise God. And it was the second kind of courage that Peter demonstrated. Let me close with this. When Achilles, the great warrior of the Greeks, was told that if he went out to a particular battle, the battle was coming up, and he was warned, he was told that if you go into this battle, Achilles, you're going to die. You will, you will surely die. And he answered in the immortal sentence, and this is what he said, Nevertheless, I am for going on. Nevertheless, I am for going on. And I think Peter, Peter in that very moment, knew the peril in which he stood. He too was for going on. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. He too was for going on. We too are to be for going on. The Christian life does not give you the opportunity, or I should say does give you the opportunity, to take your life into your own hands. 
However, you keep going on with Jesus and He will make it real clear to you. You take your life and you put it in His hands. Amen? You put, it, you put your life in His hands. But I think it goes even further than that. We are actually placing our lives in the hands of God Almighty. Amen? And we need to know that. We need to, be, we need to see that. We need to come away from our own understanding on things and our own self-life and what we think and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. No, we give it over to God. We, we say, Jesus, here it is. Here's my life. Take it. Praise God. Transform it. Conform it. And that is how we too can be in favor of going on in the Christian life. Amen? All of the way, going on all of the way to the Inventors Hall of Fame. God is the grand inventor. Amen? And He's got His own Hall of Fame. It's called Heaven. Amen? Take your life into your own hands, but don't leave them there. Take that life and turn it over to the hands of Almighty God. Let Jesus be in control. Let Him take it all the way. And we will indeed then be in favor of going on. Amen? Going on with Jesus. You can't go wrong with that. I'm telling you, He's never made a mistake. He's never flubbed up life once. Oh, it looks like it, sure. Here's this young guy, goes to the cross, gets nailed onto there, suffers and dies, you know, and buried and all of that. Looks like he really blew it. He didn't blow it. He was doing God's will. Amen? Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? He's calling for every one of us to go on. Be in favor of going on. But not in your own strength anymore. Now it's in the strength of God. Now it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Get rid of the self-life. Tell it to take a hike. Get, get lost. You know? Crucify it. And let Jesus have full control. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Father, and I want to thank You, Lord. I want to thank You, dear God, for this truth here today and these Scriptures that have been presented as well, dear God. They all point the way. They all make it clear that it's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. It's all about the Lord of glory. It's all about an Almighty God. It's all about You and not us. And not our circumstances. And not our problems. It's all about giving it all over into the hands of the Lord. And letting you have the glory. We thank you. We praise you dear God. In Jesus precious and holy name. Amen. amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'd like you to turn to. Uh, um, oh I'll tell you what. There's a perfect opportunity. Uh. I got a blank spot with the last hymn. Somebody look up, take my life and let it be. Amen? I was thinking as I was preaching there, boy, I, w I wish I would have picked that hymn. 597. 597, thank you. Well, here I didn't pick any hymn, and that's the one we're going to have. 597, okay? Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. 597, did you say? 597. Amen? Take my life and let it be consecrated Take my
Yes, praise God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Got a special benediction here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus and throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. Amen. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Love Jesus. Amen? Love Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Be His church. Amen. Glory to God. Amen.